Basically, I, my team at T-Mobile is called um, Digital Technology Development. What we do, um, we basically build, run, and operate infrastructure and applications that are used by our customers. So before I talk a little, little bit about the company, um, I just want to show of hands um, how many people are actually developers here? Developers, okay. How many of you work on uh, web applications? Okay, so a lot of people. Um, do you guys think state is evil, like session state is evil? I'm just curious, how many, how many think session state is evil? Do you think we can like, not have ses session state? Okay, so yeah, it's, it's a necessary evil, right? Uh, so hopefully, you know, what I am hoping to achieve from this talk is um, to kind of talk about, hey, maybe session state is not so evil. There are, there are use cases, especially if you think about our applications that we work on, our typical websites where there's some commerce type of things. You, you log into the website, and then there's a session established, and there are things that you do as a part of that session. For example, I might... Um, uh, add some products into my shopping cart. The shopping cart might be, uh, the data might be in the session state. And then when, um, when I leave, um, that data is gone, right? Uh, for us, like what some of the, some of the use cases are, um, you know, I might want to upgrade my phone uh, as a customer. I might want to buy a new accessories. Uh, so, you know, there's experiences that takes the user to kind of, um, looking for something they want to buy and then add it to the cart. So there's a lot of like state data that we deal with. Um, so, so sessions, like even though we're kind of moving into a modern application architectures where you have uh, web experiences and then they're powered by APIs, right? And we all know like we want to try to, as much as possible, build our APIs in a stateless manner. But, you know, session management is still uh, relevant and so hopefully in this talk you'll be able to see like how you can architect your modern applications in such a way that uh, there can be a stateful component uh, to your to your architecture. Um, okay, so I have to talk a little bit about the company I work for. Um, so I promise you it'll be just two slides. I, so uh, basically, um, we like to call ourselves on Carrier. Um, we um, were based out of uh, uh, Bellevue, and uh, we've been changing the industry since 2013 with uh, innovative products and services, uh, plus how uh, the way, we, the way you know, consumers and businesses buy uh, wireless products and services. Uh, we, we've been changing that um, you know, for, for a while now using, uh, using innovative products and solutions. We're a publicly traded company with two flagship brands, uh, T-Mobile and MetroPCS. Uh, and we're based out of Bellevue, uh, Washington, uh, where it's pretty much sunny all the time. I think we all know that, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So um, it's not bad. Summer, it's awesome. Um, I love, I mean, it's, Seattle's just like any other place in terms of weather. Okay, I get super excited about this slide, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, so we have our, a genius marketing team, I, I, think, I think so. Um, they, what they do is they, um, they listen to customers' problems and they understand uh, the pain points and then they come up with these really innovative programs, what we like to call uh, uncarrier moves. Um, and we've been doing this since uh, uh, 2013. And our job, our primary job as a, uh, on the technology side is to make these uncarrier moves come to life uh, using innovative products and, and technology, right? So um, the way we like to connect with customers, there are multiple ways customers connect with us. Uh, they use, uh, the first two are called the, what we call assisted channels. Uh, customers can go to um, a store and um, they can, you know, for things like buying a product or accessory, um, they can uh, call our, our awesome customer care team uh, so, and get answers to questions uh, related to their account, bill, uh, or any new products uh, that they want to buy. Uh, they can also use um, a website, uh, 
Um, if, you, if you like to do self-service kind of thing where you don't really need somebody helping you out, um, you can use the website and then as well as the, the mobile app that you can install on um, any device of your choice. Um, we're also pretty active in the, in the social media. Um, I, I don't know if some of you might already follow John Ledger, who's our CEO. He's pretty active. He tweets a lot, and you can ask questions. And so we, we, we stay real connected with our customers through you know, various channels. Uh, we've won numerous awards for uh, customer satisfaction. Okay, moving on. Um, so real quick, um, you know, even though we live in a, a cloud-first, mobile-first world, uh, web applications are still um, relevant, meaning enterprises have not um, really jumped onto that mobile bandwagon, right? Um, so there's still a lot of legacy applications that are, are, are web-based, but you want to kind of transform them. Um, the second thing that I want to kind of mention here is, so considering that you have the web applications, uh, sometimes it just makes no sense to invest in kind of transform, you know, rewriting them in mobile applications. So you still have those. Uh, so with web applications, you have, as we talked earlier, you have this problem of you know, state, right? So web is essentially stateless. We all know that. And typically, what, the way it works is um, you, uh, when you first log into a website, um, you, a session is established on the server, and then server then sends um, an ID, you, you, a session ID, down to the client uh, using a cookie. And that browser will then subsequent request for various pages. Browser will then pass that uh, session ID onto the server, and server is able to kind of bind to that, to that user session, right? That's typically how it works. This is all good uh, when you think about traditional web applications, right? Where the number of instances that are serving your website is pretty static, right? In the past, you know, they don't really change a lot. Now, when it's not OK is in the cloud native architecture, right? Where you have um, you know, your instances can go up and down. If um, the, you know, during a busy time, you might scale it so you can you know, um, meet the demands of your need. Um, so, so the problem with that is uh, with that, you have this problem of how do you make sure um, the, the session state data is actually consistent across all your instances, right? Um, in the traditional world, if you think about how we've achieved this in a production-like architecture, is you use a line a load balancer sticky session. So, so if I hit one server, uh, subsequent requests go back to the same server, right? So that was okay back then, but in the, in the cloud-native world, your requests could go to any instances, especially if your uh, experiences you know, web experiences running in a container, you could have multiple instances, and you, so you can't afford to, um, you know, have all that like use sticky sessions or have all the all the session data kind of be persisted in that uh, in that instance where you're always hitting. Uh, the second point here is um, it also doesn't confirm the the twelve factor app methodology. Uh, specifically, number six, which states uh, no process, you know, your 12 factor processes are stateless and they share nothing. Um, if they need to share the data, you have to persist it into an external backing store. Um, it can be any, any database, right? Typically a database. So, in, what this slide is showing you is uh, potentially what, what are some of the solutions, right? So you have, so we chose uh, for one of the, the applications we worked on, uh, we chose to use Redis um, as that backing store. Uh, so let me kind of walk you through uh, the architecture here from the top. Uh, so we have, on the top of the layer, we have so users hitting the uh, load balancer. And from load balancer, you, your request comes to a gateway layer. And that gateway routes the request based on uh, if it's, you know, you, request going to your ex web experience, it routes to uh, what we call micro apps. Uh, and we have, you can deploy these things in a container if you choose to. Uh, you can also, you know, if you're using, building your web experience using Angular, uh, you can put your Angular assets in S3, bu S3 bucket, uh, assuming you're using um, AWS. Um, and then 
you can have CloudFront that actually ser serves those static assets, right? So they simply, in this case, if it's a call to like a, a request going to a UI asset, um, it will just simply, you know, route your CloudFront URL. And if it's called going to what we call BFF, um, so no, that's not best friends forever. Although I like to think it's really best friends forever with the UI, right? Because essentially, that's what we call uh, back end for front end. It's the law, you know, your, your, uh, so you have a set of services underneath, microservices underneath that provides various capabilities. Uh, but at the same time, what we, what we want is something to orchestrate because typically, you know, if you look at any you know, action, transactions that the user, typical user would, would do, it involves orchestrating multiple services, right? So, and, and the other scenario is uh, you, may, you may need to kind of format the data in a specific manner uh, for your experience. Um, so in those cases, you can use a, a, a back and for front end uh, kind of model where you have it is like an a REST API, sorry. So you, your requests go through the gateway, you hit the back end, back end for front end layer, and that, because that's also stateful now, um, that's the other key point here, is it's using Redis to, um, to get to the, the session state that, um, you know, for, for that particular user session. The other thing I should point out here is we moved the, the security and authentication pieces down into the gateway layer. So if you, when your request comes to Gateway, if it's accessing an authenticated resource, um, you're going to, Gateway is going to you know, force you to go do the login. And then you, once you log in, your session is established, and, um, and then the request flows into, um, you know, potentially if it's an API call happening to your back for front end layer, it will hit the back for front end layer, and in that case also, it will bind to that same session um, and so it can then, in that layer, you can then get access to um, all of the, all of the you know state information that's already a part of that that uh, that session. A couple of other things I should point out. Um, you know, we do sometimes we do things like we have a lot of you know obviously you know big enterprise. There are legacy components that you can't just you know one day swap it out, right? It takes some time to actually transform the entire. Um, architecture, so we still have like act, you know need to call legacy components. Uh, so we do things like uh, one, as soon as the the session like login process is over, we kind of call some async asynchronously make some calls to actually load pre warm the 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 data, uh, I mean the cache with some additional information that that is user that users might need right because. Based on um, typically, you know, when you think about our use cases, users will, you know, you log in, you might, you'll go to your usage, uh, you know, information, you view that information. Um, so we can do things like this architecture. We can do things like pre-warming the the session with data that's needed uh, for that particular um, session, right? And then down in the bottom, you can see. Um, you can see all the microservices uh, layer. So it's really behind gateway and then back in for front end, which is for that experience. And then uh, down below is the back end for front end and discovers all the services it needs to orchestrate uh, using a service discovery. Moving on. Um, so the other, the other thing I should talk about, you know, so I mentioned the way we solved the, the, the session problem is using, you know, one was we needed to externalize the session data, so we use Redis for that. The other thing I want to mention here is a project called Spring Session. Um, how many of you heard of, are, are you guys using, using this today? Just curious. So what do you, what do, you do today to, um, you know, for, for externalizing session state? Do you store in, like in a product? Are you using like a load balancer, sticky session kind of thing? Okay, I think that's mostly most of the folks. That's what that's what we've seen. You know, you you uh, you you know traditionally you use you know load balancer and sticky session so that it, all the requests go to the same uh, same instance. But anyway, so Spring session is basically again Spring does a great job of uh, abstracting. And keeping things very, 
simple for developers to actually implement. Um, so Spring, Spring Session is one of those projects which allows us to kind of um, externalize the session, da you know, session data into a, some kind of backing data store. And we don't have to worry about um, where that data is going, um, because, meaning you know, it's, it's decoupled in the sense that I can swap out. Uh, today I could go with Redis, and tomorrow I can go with some other, other solutions like um, Mongo or Gemfire or Hazelcast. Uh, so with, with the Spring session, you by default, you get implementations for Redis, JDBC, Mongo, Gemfire, and Hazelcast. Uh, JDBC is where if you, if you want to use some relational database to persist uh, your session information, uh, it allows us to use that. Uh, so if any of these um, out-of-the-box solutions doesn't work for you, for whatever reason, you have a need to integrate with some other backing store, uh, you can roll your own implementation. So the architecture is extensible in such a way that it's really easy to build uh, something custom of your own. Um, also, it supports uh, clustered sessions without um, being tied to an application container-specific solution. Uh, again, we know, like in the Java world, um, you know, you got servlet. With that, you get basically a... a you know, we talked about this earlier, where you know, your session is established, and then the, bra you know, the session ID is sent via cookie, right? So with, with the spring session, you can, you know, again, the problem with that is, you know, you have to kind of stick to the load balancer sticky sessions. Uh, this allows us to have clustered sessions without actually being uh, using anything like load balancer sticky sessions or even, you know, being tied to a, a, a container-specific solution such as Tomcat. Um, the other, the other thing to you know, kind of call out here is um, um, you can also use uh, session IDs can be exchanged via HTTP headers. Um, you, know, you saw in that um, our, the, the architecture slide that we looked earlier, right? We have API calls going to the back end, back end for front end layer. Uh, so we can actually now, the UI can actually pass when, they, when it's calling the, the, the BFF layer, it can, it can pass the session ID as, as a, you know, via the header. Um, and then the last thing here is the WebSocket support. So if you're using um, WebSockets for like, you know, real-time communication from server to client, um, Spring Session actually works really nicely uh, with WebSocket. So quick, who's using Redis today? Did anyone using Redis? So mostly for cache, I'm guessing, like caching things. Okay. Um, so just a quick overview um, of Redis. Uh, basically, Redis is, a, as, we, as we may already know, it's an in-memory uh, key value database. Uh, because it's memory, it provides us fast access to the data, which is really nice. Um, you can also, I don't know how many people know, Redis can actually be used to persist data into the disk. So it's almost like a database. Uh, it does the persistence in an asynchronous manner, so there's always a chance of some data being lost in failures and uh, disaster recovery type of scenarios. Uh, it's written in C, and um, it's recommended to deploy Redis in, um, um, on Linux. Um, so there are, from a, from a developer standpoint, uh, you know, we, the reality is we build applications in different platforms, right? Java, some people build applications in Java, some .NET. Uh, so there are a variety of client implementations for various programming languages um, that's available. So it's really easy to, the point is it's really easy to integrate in Redis in, you know, into your application. Um, and then last bit here is uh, you can, there are two ways you can deploy Redis. Uh, one is uh, in a master-slave mode, where you have a single master that's taking all the, the requests for, you know, query for data. And then, uh, and then you have maybe one or more slaves that, so in case the master goes down, you know, one of, you know, one of the slaves can be promoted to a master from an HA standpoint. Uh, and then you have the, the cluster mode, which, um, which is primarily used to scale, uh, where you, dis, you know, basically shard the data across multiple master nodes uh, for, to achieve scalability and high availability. So the charts down, uh, what, they're sh what that's showing, I'm not sure if it's really clear or not. Um, don't think so. So the, the key thing to call out here is, uh, this is again um, from um, one, of the, one of the articles pub published by Redis Labs. 
uh, they did a survey. Uh, but the, the, the first one, the one on the, my right, which is showing the use cases of using Redis, and specific one to kind of call out is that uh, the second one from the, from the, from the other end, uh, that's basically session management. Uh, so people, you can see from the chart that people are really using it for session management. Uh, and then the, the one on, uh, on my left is, uh, is basically you know, kind of the use cases, uh, industries in, 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 uh, that are using Redis. Uh, so there's a variety of industries that are already using it. So again, the key point is it's a proven solution uh, used for very, there are various use cases it supports and then uh, a lot of people are using it. So. Okay, next I want to talk about uh, some of the deployment options. Um, so there are basically, obviously there are more, um, but I want to kind of focus on the three things. Um, so you can deploy Redis on your own, I mean, use the open source version and spin up of, you know, the infrastructure that's required and install Redis, and then you can run and operate and manage uh, yourself. Um, and then uh, the other option is you can, uh, Amazon has a service called Elastic Cache. Uh, it lets you run um, Redis or Memcached, uh, depending on your, on your choice. Um, and, and it's a fully managed service um, that you don't, now you don't have to be responsible for installing, configuring, and even supporting it, right? So you get you know, management, monitoring aspects of it. Uh, but one thing, I'm not going to go too detailed into it. There are various options to, for deployment. Uh, but one thing I want to kind of call out is I did some uh, cost analysis. And um, there is, a, you know, if you look at the, the cost for a, a cache node in, in AWS, there's about 35% uh, increase compared to an EC2 instance. So if you were to buy, you know, get a, spin up an EC2 instance, and then do install Redis on your own. You know, the cost that you would pay for that versus cost for a cache node does like a 35% increase. Sometimes that may be a, um, a blocker for you, right? Because depending on the cost uh, constraints. But again, the co that cost you're paying for, you know, being able to not have to worry about the management and monitoring aspects of it. Um, again, Azure also has the service um, that allows you to, it's basically a fully managed service that allows you to spin up Redis clusters. Um, and there are basically three different types of um, uh, deployment options in Azure. Uh, one is uh, a basic, which, um, which is basically a single node. Um, and uh, you, don't, you don't really have any HA or you know, SLAs around that. So if that node goes down, um, you know, you, you, you're basically down, your application's down. Typically not recommended uh, to, you know, use it in uh, production-like, um, you know, situations. Uh, there's also the standard and, and premier tier um, that gives you, um, you know, HA and, and SLAs around uh, when, when, you know, the, the master's down or uh, you need to uh, fail over to a, a secondary uh, cluster. Um, you also have Redis Labs, again, I, I don't have a much of experience, uh, but it essentially um, Redis can actually, you can have Redis Labs kind of spin up your Redis cluster in the cloud provider of your choice. Um, I think one of the key things to kind of keep in mind is because Redis kind of created, you know, they created the, the, the Redis. So it might be a good thing for people that they know better than probably any, any one of us, right, in terms of, you know, the best way to uh, tune it, uh, provision, tune, and manage it, right? So that may be an option that, that's worth considering. Uh, we chose to uh, run on, on our own. Uh, we have some teams uh, that, that, in some, some use cases, we, have, um, we use our own Redis cluster, and then there are certain other teams that uh, use a managed service because, again, the maturity level of that team is uh, not as high where you, where you need it to be to be able to kind of manage the in infrastructure and, and monitor and, uh, all aspects of uh, that. So, so again, you know, depending on you know, where you are with the maturity level, you might choose to run on your own versus uh, use a, a fully managed service. Okay, next um, I want to kind of talk about a couple of, um, so, you know, how, how do you monitor, monitor 
Redis. Um, so let me just kind of quickly go through it. Um, so basically, this is uh, what's shown here is uh, um, you know system basic system metrics that you should be monitoring. Um, you know the the one of the key thing is the over here is the memory usage. Uh, again, it depends on how many keys you have in the database, and and you also need to factor in the the memory that your OS needs. Um, also, you should monitor the disk usage. Um, you know because if you're using persistence. Um, it's a good thing to, to have. Um, and then I'm gonna, I'm, you can use this as a reference. So there are like, you know, guidelines on um, what, what that does and then when, do you, when, you know, when, when should you um, use alerting, you know, things of that nature. Um, and then ne the next one, what, this table, what it's showing is the, some availability related uh, metrics. Specifically, the one to call out here is the connected client. So this is the number of, um, you know, if you want to see the active sessions, uh, the connected clients is, is something that, that you, can, um, you can look to see how many users are logged into the database, um, into your application. Um, the, some of the other things to kind of call out is um, the, uh, there's, uh, you know, RDB changes last save. That's basically, uh, you know the amount, the number of changes that are pending since the the server persisted last time. You know, again, if if that timeline is pretty high, it's a good indication that something's failing in terms of being persisting to the to the database, to the, to the storage. Uh, so I'm going to quickly skip through this. Again, you guys can look at this for reference. Uh, let's quickly talk about some of the monitoring tools. Um, so you have Redis CLI. Uh, CLI has two commands, info and monitor. Info kind of, uh, you can get um, a, a general information about the server. And then uh, client connections, uh, it also gives you memory usage information. Um, you can also you know, view things uh, related to persistence. Um, and then CPU usage statistics. Um, and then um, the, the, so one other thing to call out is uh, info command doesn't have much of an impact on the um, performance, overall performance. The monitor, on the other hand, has, um, has impact on the performance. In some cases, so typically you'll use monitor if you want to troubleshoot uh, an issue. Um, so, but, so just be aware that when you're using that, you, you, there is an overhead. Um, so the other thing to shown here is Redis Stat. Um, so Redis Stat is actually a Ruby application. There's there's kind of web-based dashboard, and then you can also view performance information in terminal using a VM Stat-like format. Um, what we again, a lot of I'm, I'm gonna have to quick. You know, I'm running out of time. So um, the the couple one thing that to call out is we use Telegraph. So we we use Influx uh, as a time series database to store all the metrics and Grafana to kind of you know, visualize that metric. So we use Telegraph in our, you know, in our world, uh, but there are you know, different options depending on um, what, you know, how you're, what, what tools and technologies you're using for your monitoring stack, you might choose one of these options. Um, so let me, this, I'm gonna quickly just uh, jump into this slide. Um, so why use Redis uh, for session store? Um, so number one here is you want to externalize data. Hopefully you've seen, um, you know, being, you know, having um, the the gateway. Set, you know, we moved gateway, um, all the authentication authorization aspects into the gateway, and then you have multiple components in your application stack that actually depends on that uh, session state, right? So it's kind of good from that perspective, and then also, you know, in terms of being able to share session across um, multiple instances. A uh, couple of things to note is you can expire kill sessions. So if you see a, a rogue, you know, the user session, you can you can easily go into Redis and expire that key. Um, you can act, you know, identify active users in the system. It works very well in a clustered environment. And the last two things, it scales well and performs really well. Uh, again, with clustering option, you can scale, um, partition your um, database across multiple nodes, and achieve maximum scale. And then because it's in memory, you have a lot of performance uh, gains. Just some real world use cases. Um, um, you know, we uh, have an application called, uh, used in the Metro PCS. Um, it's, it's a retail, um, retail channel, what we call retail channel. Um, it's a web-based application used by uh, stores. 
and uh, dealers and all the call centers. Um, some of the patterns that we use, uh, we built it for maximum reuse, um, and then uh, basically it uses leverages Netflix um, OSS stack, as you've seen in, earlier in the, in the slides. And then we also use the same strategy for um, AEM-based application. Um, again, to, you know, in terms of externalizing the, uh, um, the session state data. I think I'm about time. If there's, um, if there's any question, my contact information is uh, all the way in the end. Um, it's a lot to cover in one, one you know, 30 minute talk, but just reach out to me in terms of um, uh, if you have any questions. Also, um, I, I did have a demo, uh, but unfortunately, as you see, I, I, I couldn't even go through all the slides. But, um, I will point out the, the um, link to the GitHub repo that has the sample application, um, which basically can think the, the, the high level, the architecture diagram that I showed, right? It basically, there's a sample application that actually models that entire um, architecture. So you could, I'll point you guys to that repo and then you, you guys can look at that as a reference. Thanks.